I was on the front page with the president. How about that for media exposure? And so everybody around the globe knew about this creationist, geologist, who had sued Grand Canyon National Park and won. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Snelling. You can tell I don't speak like you do. I'm a native Australian, uh, born and raised in Sydney, uh, trained as a geologist in Sydney, got my PhD at the University of Sydney, and I've been working in creation ministry for over 40 years. And uh, currently, I'm the director of research at Answers in Genesis and a geologist, of course. And uh, that's what I want to talk to you about, the research that I'm currently doing. I've, uh, I've been through the Grand Canyon over 50 times on raft trips, hiked in the Grand Canyon. I've done several research projects in the Grand Canyon. But I've had a major project that I'm just in the process of completing. It's been going on for over 10 years. And I'm, we're going to talk about it. Uh, very strategic research, uh, in fact. And so let's talk about uh, the folds, or the rocks in the Grand Canyon. Now, here you can see a view from the south rim of the, of the Grand Canyon. You can see all these flat-lying rock layers. Uh, it's like a stack of pancakes. And uh, everyone's familiar with that view. And all those flat-lying layers that make up the walls of the Grand Canyon, nearly 4,500 feet of them, uh, are full of fossils. And uh, like we, as we like to say to people, you know, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water over the earth as evidence for the flood. And in fact, many of these layers can be traced right across North America and even to other continents. And that's exactly what we'd expect from the flood. But why the Grand Canyon of all places? Well, um, Grand Canyon is used as exhibit A for millions of years uh, of slow and gradual evolutionary geology processes. Uh, the secular scientific community love to talk about the Grand Canyon. You know, there are other canyons that are longer and deeper and wider. Uh, that, but why the Grand Canyon? Well, in that region, uh, it's a desert, so you don't have the biology cover, covering up the geology. I, I like to joke about that to my bi biological colleagues. But it's true. The rock layers are well exposed. And you can go from the bottom of the Grand Canyon to the top of the Grand Canyon. And then you walk to the north up through uh, uh, into Utah, up through Zion Canyon and up to Bryce Canyon. And you, you've got a stack of layers, nearly 14,000 feet thick in total, that span the whole geologic record. And so it's a great place to talk about the so-called geologic column, the layers that make up the, the Earth's surface. And therefore, because it's used for exhibit A for uh, millions of years of slow and gradual evolutionary geological processes, we need to reclaim it as exhibit A for recent creation and the global flood. And that's why uh, flood geologists like myself spend so much time talking about the Grand Canyon, because everybody's familiar with the Grand Canyon. Millions of people visit the canyon every year. And uh, those who haven't really want to go there, it's on their bucket list. And so it's a good place because everybody can resonate with the details that we talk about. So let's dive in a little bit deeper here. The Grand Canyon was carved through a plateau. The top of the South Rim is at seven, over 7,000 feet above sea level. The top of the North Rim is 1,000 feet higher. Uh, and it's full of fossils, marine fossils, th these layers. Uh, so that means the oceans once covered this area, which of course would have been during the flood. But the point is this plateau has been pushed up. And the real question is, you know, did the, did the Colorado River carve out the Grand Canyon? Well, everybody agrees that the plateau was pushed up before the canyon was carved into it. But that means the top of the, the plateau would, be, would have been at a higher elevation than the headwaters of the Colorado River and water doesn't flow uphill. Hmm, that's a problem. Uh, another problem is that at the edge of the plateau, which we'll come to in a moment in the eastern side of the eastern end of the canyon, uh, that the plateau drops off. In fact, the layers, the whole sequence of flat lying sedimentary layers have been bent and we'll come back to that in a moment. But the point is that the, the river, the current Colorado River, doesn't go around the plateau, it cuts right through the middle of the plateau. It does a right-hand turn. 
Another thing I like to point out to people when I take them through the, the canyon, we go over raft, uh, over rapids. Everybody enjoys these raft trips because of the fun going through the rapids. How do the rapids form? They form because debris is being washed into the Colorado River. And many of these from side canyons, flash floods in side canyons, and many of these rapids are the same as when John Wesley Powell went down the river in 1869. They haven't changed. That means the Colorado River isn't cleaning out its channel. So if it's not even cleaning out its channel today, how could it possibly ever have carved out the canyon? The canyon is actually filling in. And so I like to make these points because everybody wants to know, well, how did the Grand Canyon form? We can talk about other features, but that's a, a top question that people ask. And there, there are several evidences there that I've presented to you that help you appreciate why we believe the canyon is uh, the Grand Canyon area is exhibit A for recent creation and a global flood cataclysm. Well, as I said a moment ago, that you've got this plateau, and at the eastern edge of this plateau, the, it's called the Kaibab Plateau, the whole sequence of flat lying sedimentary layers. See, there they are, there you can see these flat lying layers, sedimentary layers, uh, full of fossils. They they go across to the east of the plateau, uh, and then at the edge of the plateau, here's the here's a satellite view, by the way, and you can see the green. The green is is due to the forests, okay, and you can see I've highlighted the Kaibab Plateau there. It's greater than seven thousand feet above sea level, and you can see that on the eastern edge, it turns to brown because in that image, because along that edge eastern edge the layers have been bent and uh, we call that a, a monocline a monocline that means one monocline one bend in the layers and, and i'll explain what i mean here let me let me show you that's a side view you know if we did a cut through the plateau uh you can see the layers here on the screen uh the kaibab plateau to the left and then over to the right where the elevation is lower the layers have been bent in a single looping bend, an S, an S on its side, so to speak, a stretched S on its side. We call that a monocline. And you can see the whole rock layer sequence has been bent. Here's a view from uh, one of the eastern overlooks of the Grand Canyon. You can see the bending of these layers. You can see the drop in elevation there. It's quite a significant drop. It's, it's almost 3,000 feet. Uh, and so... Uh, these layers have been bent. Now, in what condition were they when they were bent? This is the, this is the question that we're going to focus on in this uh, presentation. Here is where the layers have been bent in one of the side canyons. We can access this in a side canyon called Carbon Canyon. Uh, uh, it's a side canyon to the main uh, Grand Canyon, the Colorado River Channel. And uh, you can see... You can't see off screen there, but the, the, the layers, and I'll see more in a moment, they actually turn uh, 90 through 90 degrees. And you can see the man there standing there for scale. You can see how this is a sandstone layer, sand turned to stone. You see, geology isn't that complex. Sandstone is sand turned to stone. Limestone is lime turned to stone. See, we geologists are smart. We like to keep things simple. And everybody can understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so you can see if you if you trace along there, you can see from the left hand side there where I've got the red arrow, you can follow the layers along to where the man is standing, and suddenly they bend and turn upright. Uh, and so look at that at closely. I'm going to zoom in here. Now you can see that bend. Now you want to think about it. Hard rock is brittle. You know, take like a piece of man-made rock concrete. Okay, you're familiar with the concrete on your sidewalk or your, your driveway. Get a slab of that and try to bend it. It won't bend easily, will it? It will shatter. It will break. Look at the bend in this, in this fold. It's smooth. Yeah, there's a few cracks there, but they're actually drying cracks. They're not cracks due to the bending. When can you bend concrete? When it comes out of the cement truck, the, con the delivery 
concrete truck. Okay, when it's soft and wet, when the cement hasn't hardened, you know what cement is, don't you? It, uh, what the concrete is, it's gravel, sand, and a cement with water. And what happens is that when the water dries out, the cement fills in all the spaces between the sand and the, the gravel, and it hardens to, be for, for, to form a man-made rock called concrete. You know, I like to illustrate it this way, and this is a sandstone. Imagine a bucket full of golf balls, okay? The golf balls represent the sand grains. They're stacked. Well, there's spaces in between, and when they get deposited by water, the water is in between all those so-called golf balls, okay, the sand grains. And that, that water can be full of chemicals. So when the water, when the water evaporates, the, rock, the, the sand mixture dries out, what's going to happen? The chemicals are going to precipitate, come out of solution and fill in all those cracks. And that forms the cement, th those spaces between the golf balls. We call those the pores, the pore spaces. And the chemicals that come out of the water when they dry out is the cement. And that cement bonds all the grains together to turn sand into sandstone. See, I told you it's not very difficult to understand. You know, and that's that's what a sandstone is. And so you can see that this bend had to have occurred when the sandstone was still soft and wet, when it was still sand saturated with water and chemicals. It hadn't completely dried out. And, and so the drying out and the hardening had to occur after the bending, okay? Now, here's a, here's a map, and, you know, this looks like very complicated, but let, let me walk you through it. You can see that black arrow there, CCF. That's the Carbon Canyon Fold, the one that we just saw. And you can see that there's, it's on the edge of that red line that goes north-south. That's called the East Kaibab Monocline. Okay, that's the edge, remember, the edge of this plateau through which the canyon is carved. Well, you can see there's lots of other north-south red lines. You know, imagine, imagine a carpet, a piece of carpet, if you sort of move it, move it towards, you take two ends and start to move them together. What's going to happen? It's going to, it's going to crumble, it's going to ripple, etc. Well, there's other, other places in the plateau where the layers have also been bent as a, as a consequence of this, this whole process. And that's what all those red lines mean. Okay, and now you see another black arrow there. That's Mon F. That stands for the Monument Fold. That's another fold. And here it is here. This one is right by the Colorado River. We go past it on our raft trips. And, you know, that doesn't look very large. But if I was to put a person up there, they'd look like an ant. Uh, that's quite a significant bend in the layers, okay? And that's where there's been a wrinkle in these layers in the middle of the plateau. Well, there's other places too. I've, I've gone back to this map and you can see again, there's another one there called Matt F. That stands for the Matt Catamoeba Fold. That's a long, a long name. But uh, in, in the previous two folds, the Carbon Canyon Fold and the Monument Fold, it was the sandstone that was bent that we could study. Well, in the Matcat Fold, the Matcat Amoeba Fold, uh, this is limestone, okay? And you can see me, yes, that's me up there. I'm a bit bigger than an ant in that photograph, but I'm there for scale. And r right where my head is, you can see there's a change of colour between that reddish uh, reddish brown to that lighter tan color. That's the boundary between two different types of limestone layers in the one limestone unit, overall limestone unit. The overall limestone unit is called the Muave limestone, but there's there's sub limestones in it. Okay, and this is this is another bend. And then we go further west uh, to. Uh, uh, to what we call the uh, Whitmore helicopter pad or helipad fold. This is another one of these folds. Uh, this is, in fact, where we often uh, get out of the canyon with a helicopter ride out of the canyon, park the boats and get on a helicopter. And here we see uh, shale. This is the bright angel shale that's been bent. And you can see there's different colours in the shale according to the impurities that are in the shale. Now, a shale is a mudstone, mud that's turned to 
to stone. So we think about it, you've got mud, you've got mudstone, siltstone, and sandstone. So sand, silt, and mud are actually size terms. Sand grains are larger than silt, silt grains, they're smaller, and mud is even finer still. See, as I said, I keep on saying, geology is not that hard to understand. Okay, so this is the Whitmore helipod, helipad fold. And so there's three different rock units uh, that have been bent that we can study. There's sandstone, there's uh, there's the, um, the the silt, uh, the sorry siltstone and mudstone in the Bright Angel uh, unit that, that's right here on the screen, and then there's the limestone in the Matt Catameter fold, the Muav limestone. So that's three rock units and four folds that uh, I focused on in this study, and I'm going to explain more as we go along. So here's the problem that we're, we're going to focus in on. It's not a problem for me. It's a problem for those who claim that the layers took millions and millions of years to form. Because you see, these three folded or bent rock layers, the Tapit sandstone, the Bright Angel shale, and the Muav limestone, the conventional wisdom is that these were supposedly deposited about 500 million years ago, okay? I, I'm just, that's what they say, 500 million years ago. And I don't have time to go into how they get, derive that number, but it's at the bottom of the pile of, of the stack of pancakes. You know, below the Tapit sandstone is an erosion surface that goes all around the globe. Everyone agrees that it does. And below the Tapit sandstone, we have layers that have hardly any fossils in them, only microscopic fossils. And then suddenly, after we get over that erosion surface and get into the Tapit sandstone, we've got all these marine fossils. And all the way up through the other layers in the canyon, many of us flood geologists believe that that's the evidence of where the flood begins, okay? Because you'd expect that when the fountains of the Great Deep broke open and there was upheavals at the beginning of the flood and the waters rose to cover the, cover the, cover the globe, it's going to erode off the pre-flood world, pick up the creatures and bury them in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, that's exactly what we see, an erosion surface. And then the first of these layers is the Tapit sandstone and then the Bright Angel Shale and then the Uav limestone. So it makes sense that these layers are, uh, were early in the whole sequence of layers. They estimate 500 million years ago. We would say, of course, that it was the beginning of the flood. But more of that in a moment. Now, after these layers in, that make up the walls in the Grand Canyon were deposited, over four, about 4,500 feet of them, as I said earlier, you can walk up into Utah, up through Zion Canyon, and that's a spectacular place to visit. The, the cliffs there are 2,000 feet high with just one sandstone unit, the Navajo sandstone. And then you can go up even higher to uh, Bryce Canyon, which actually isn't a canyon. It's actually the walls of a, of a plateau that have been eroded. But it's a beautiful vista there. Um, that whole sequence of layers is, a, is another 10,000 feet of layers on top of the layers that are in the Grand Canyon. So there you have the Tapit sandstone at the bottom of the canyon, on top of it uh, are over 10,000 feet, getting up to 14,000 feet of other layers right on, stacked on top of them. That's a huge stack of, of pancakes stacked on top of one another. And, uh, and so uh, they claim that these layers were then deposit these 14,000 feet of layers or thereabouts uh, stacked on top of the Tapit sandstone took a supposed 450 million years to be deposited. And then everybody agrees that after these layers were deposited, all the layers were pushed up to form this Kaibab Plateau. Now, we don't have go time to go into the details, but it's an interesting story. Uh, there was, there was plate tech, catastrophic plate tectonics during the flood when the pre-flood supercontinent broke apart and all the fragments moved around and some of them collided. Towards the end of the flood, the Pacific Ocean floor was being shoved under Western North America. And, and when that slowed down, the, 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 
the plate, the ocean floor underneath, caused the Western United States to be uplifted to form the Rocky Mountains and the Kaibab Plateau. That's that, that's the short story. Um, I wrote an article for Answers magazine just recently on the raising of the Rocky Mountains, and there's more details in that article. So look that up, the Rocky Mountains, and that'll give you some more background to the formation of the Kaibab Plateau. But the conventional wisdom is that that occurred 50 to 60 million years ago. Okay? Think about the math here. The layers started to be formed, the three layers at the bottom of the stack of pancakes that we're going to going to focus on the Tapit sandstone, the bright angel shale and the Muar uh, limestone that was supposedly deposited 500 million years ago. They were bent 450 million years after they were deposited, after all these other layers were stacked on top of them. Okay. Now you would think that in that 450 million years, with all these layers stacked on top of them, pressing down on it, okay, you know, imagine our bucket of golf balls and you've got a, 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 something pressing down on the bucket of golf balls. It's going to squeeze the golf balls and push them down, pack them in really tight. And over 450 million years, come on, the water would get squeezed out, it would dry out, and it, and it should have hardened before the folding occurred, before the bending of these layers occurred. And so that presents a problem because, as I said before, you take hardened rock, and I've got a, a, a diagram here just to, to reinforce what we've said before, a hardened rock like concrete, it breaks and shatters when it's bent. But we don't see that, we don't see that in the folds. The sandstone, the siltstone, and the shale layers have been bent in these folds smoothly without any shattering. So that tells us they can't have been hard and brittle. Otherwise, they would have shattered when they were bent in the folds. Therefore, they still the layers had to still be soft and still wet when they were bent in these folds. And the only time when these sediment layers were still soft and wet would have been still very soon after they were deposited. Okay? And so... That's the problem. You see, here's, here's the Carbon Canyon fold again. Look at the nice, smooth bend again. And I want to imprint that on your mind. You know, even an eight-year-old child can see that that's nice and smooth and it's not shattered and you can show them a piece of concrete and tell them how to, what would happen if you try to bend concrete. It's not that difficult to understand. And that's why it irritates uh, uh, our opponents, which I'm going to come to in a moment, that this research was being done because the answer is quite obvious. These layers had to have been bent while they were still soft and wet. And, uh, and so the folding could not have occurred after 450 million years after these layers were deposited and buried under 10,000, 14,000 feet of other layers. It had to be very soon after these layers were deposited. And remember, you've got all these layers have to be deposited. All the layers have to be deposited before the sandstone at the bottom of the pile could harden. You see what I mean? If, if this all occurred during the flood, there's only one year between the layers being deposited, the first of the layers, I mean, the Tapit sandstone, as I said before, as I explained earlier, and the Bright Angel Shale and the Muav limestone would have been deposited at the beginning of the biblical flood year. Okay? And then all the other layers on top, the ten to 14,000 feet of other layers, were deposited only in the following months, not over 450 million years. This is the biblical framework of understanding Earth history. That's what we read in, in, in Genesis chapter 6 through 8 about the flood. You know, all the high hills under the whole of the heaven were covered with water and, and everything perished and the water covered the whole earth so that there was a global ocean. And then what happened at the end of the flood? Uh, Psalm 104 talks about the mountains were raised, the valleys sank, the waters drained off the face of the earth to the boundaries that God set for them. 
that they would never come and flood the earth again. Well, that has to be a reference to the end of the flood because God hasn't flooded the earth again. He promised, no, he wouldn't do that. It, that those verses can't be a reference to the creation week when there was a global ocean on the first two days of the of the of creation week and then the third day god raised the dry land it can't be referring to that because if it was referring to that god broke his promise when he flooded the earth at the time of the flood so it has to be a reference to the flood and so there we have biblical confirmation that the kaibab plateau the rocky mountains all the major mount high mountains around the globe were raised at the end of the flood. Not the Appalachians, as a side note, they formed during the flood. And uh, you can go onto our website and there's an article I wrote about uh, that included what happened with the Appalachians during the flood. Look, look that up about, about catastrophic plate tectonics during the flood. So that's always your go-to site for information. If you've got questions, go to the website, type in the search engine, suitable words, and hey, presto, you'll usually get an article. We've got thousands of articles there that you can refer to that will help you understand these issues further. But the point I'm making here is in Psalm 104, we have biblical confirmation that these plateaus, the Kaibab Plateau, the Rocky Mountains, were formed at the end of the flood. And so that's at the a year, okay, a year. And remember, a year since the, since the first of the layers were, were deposited. And so they would, it would have been still soft. After all, as these layers were deposited in this area, you know, the 14,000 feet of layers with the Tapit sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, the Muav at the bottom, they still had the floodwaters covering the earth for over five months before it started to drain off. So everything was saturated and saturated. There wasn't time for it to, to, to dry out yet. And then it was raised when it was still soft and wet. And so obviously at the end of the flood, when that happened and the waters were draining off, the, the, these layers would be bent, still wet and soft and therefore they would be easily bent smoothly in these folds. You see what I mean? We can explain it, the observational evidence of how smooth the bending in these folds are. We can explain that based on God's word and it all fits. The, the what we see in God's world confirms what we read in God's word. Now, I chose my words carefully there because we weren't there when the flood happened. So we're not trying to prove the Bible. No, the Bible is our authority. That's where we start. It gives us the framework for understanding the world. It gives us the framework for the observations we see in the real world. And that's why I said, our observations confirm what we read in God's world. Now, now wait a minute. Our opponents will protest and say, oh, you came to the observations with a preconceived idea as how you're going to interpret the evidence. Well, yes, that's exactly what they do. They come to the evidence, the observations, with a preconceived belief in millions of years of slow geological processes. That's how modern geology works. So they're not neutral. They have a bias as well. They already believe in millions of years. And therefore, they interpret the observations within that framework. So I need to emphasize that because, you know, people will, will, will howl at you. Opponents will howl at you and say you're biased. You need to, say, to remind them that the scientists weren't there either. Everybody has a bias. It's a question of which bias is the best bias to be biased with anyway. You've heard that probably before from my colleague, Ken Ham. And it's a good, good lesson to remember. No scientist is neutral. They, they all have a bias. Everyone has a different pair of glasses to view the world. That's what we call our worldview. And my worldview is that God's word is true. He was there. He saw what happened. He's the creator. He knows everything. He never makes mistakes. He never tells lies. And he was saw what happened and he's told us what happened. And therefore we can trust his word. And so that's our starting point. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's important that we go over those details to give context for all that we're saying about this research. So that's the problem, okay, that the, the secular scientists face. 
And so the, the solution is that since the sedimentary layers were bent smoothly without shattering in these folds, only the recent biblical global flood cataclysm year explains these observations. I mean, it was recent. We know it was recent. Why? Well, we've got the we've got the chronological framework given to us there in the book of Genesis. Those genealogies were there for a reason. To not only to mark time. No, you go to the book of Matthew. Where does Matthew begin? He begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus came as our kinsman redeemer. He was the last Adam, the second Adam, the one who would fix things up that Adam messed up in the first place. He was coming to rescue us, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for the rebellion that Adam and Eve and the mess they caused back there in the Garden of Eden. Okay? And so Mo, uh, Matthew was tracing Jesus' family lineage back to Adam. He had to be able to show if, if the Apostle Paul was going to sh- claim that that Adam that uh, Jesus was the last Adam or the second Adam, uh, both terms are used there in the Scriptures, that you should pl- be able to trace his ancestry back to, Gen- back to Genesis, back to Adam. And so we have these direct father-son lineages that allow us to add up the chronology. And so we know that the flood was only 4,350 years ago, give or take, uh, from from today. So it was recent, not millions of years ago, only thousands of years ago. And it was only a year long. You know, we're told the day and the uh, the month of the the year of uh, 600th year of Noah's life. And then we're told when he came off the ark, it was up to his 601st year, the month and the and the day of the month. And so it was just only uh, over a, uh, just over a year. And so what that means, folks, is that instead of there being 500 million years for all this to happen, from the layers being deposited to the layers being pushed up and bent, instead of being 500 million years, it was only a year. And that's why this research is significant. Studying these folds automatically wipes out 500 million years of so-called geologic time. And that that puts the skids on this whole idea of millions of years in the Grand Canyon. And this is a significant a significant research project there. And so it's a huge problem for evolutionary old earth geologists and even old earth geologists that claim uh, that they believe God's word and they claim they're Christians. And I'm not going to doubt whether they're Christians or not, but they're not, they're putting their faith in the opinions of scientists who weren't there instead of trusting God who was there and told us what happened and made it very clear. And so it's not surprising that these evolutionary old earth geologists were opposed to this research project, but more of that in a moment. Let me tell you something else before we get down to some more details. Because obviously, our evolutionary colleagues are aware of this problem. And so when there's a problem, they have a rescuing device. I mean, that's what everyone does. If someone challenges your, your ideas, you try to think up somewhat, something that will rescue you. We call that a rescued, rescuing device. Okay. And so how do they explain? And we have to, we have to be able to counter this. Not only do we have to show that the layers were bent while they were still soft and wet we have to tackle their rescuing device to show that it doesn't rescue them at all okay and so it's a double whammy it's a left right uh, punch and uh, knockout and so what is their rescuing device well they say that since these layers were buried under over ten thousand feet of layers that over the 450 million years subsequently when all these layers were stacked on top Everything was compressed and and and, and, and uh, down sufficiently that it began to heat the rock. So the pressure and the heat eventually made the rock plastic like Play-Doh. And you know what Play-Doh is like, don't you? It's it's soft, it's malleable. You can you can shape it without without it fracturing or cracking. And so they say that well, the heat and the pressure would have made the rock plastic. And that would have made it easy for the bending to occur without shattering. And, and it would have occurred by the grains gliding past one another smoothly. Okay, you can, if you zero it in with a microscope and watch 
you know, take take Play-Doh, and if it was made up of, had sand grains in it, and you, you smoothed it out and then you try to bend it, well, the sand grains in the Play-Doh would move with the, with the dough and they'd glide, glide past one another. See, it's not that difficult to understand. And so that's why they, what they say must have happened. And so the, the heat, and the, but the problem is that the heat and the pressure that made these rocks plastic so they could bend should also have changed the rock layer, okay, the rock layers. Uh, when you apply heat and pressure to a mudstone, okay, when you apply heat and, and pressure to a mudstone, it turns into a slate or a phyllite or a schist, a different rock. We call it a metamorphic rock. Everybody knows, you know, a caterpillar spins a cocoon and when it comes out, it's a butterfly. It's metamorphosed. We call about the metamorphosis of the butterfly, okay? Well, we can take a, a, a mud rock, like a mudstone, a shale, and under heat and pressure, it turns into a metamorphic rock. It metamorphoses. And if the heat and pressure gets sufficient, it will actually melt. And let me show you. Here in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, this is in the inner gorge below the Tapit sandstone where we've got granites and we've got metamorphic rocks. You can see in this image, I've got an arrow pointing to it. You can see those pink veins. Well, the dark rock is the metam metamorphic rock. It used to be a, a, a mudstone and a siltstone. And it's metamorphosed and it got so warm with the heat and pressure that some of it melted to form these pink granitic veins. Okay, so that's the sort of rock you'd expect with a lot of heat and pressure. Now, of course, they're not claiming, they're not claiming that the rocks got that hot with a stack of pancakes, but if, if, if the, the layers were compressed and heated, the pressure and the heat should, should have changed some of the minerals in the sandstone and the mudstone and siltstone and the limestone in these layers that are now bent. It should have changed the minerals and it should have changed what we call the texture. That is how the minerals in the, under the microscope, we can see how they relate to one another. We should be able to see where the grains move past one another. We should be able to see where the, the cement probably got a little bit fractured or distorted. There's a whole series of observations that are well known when, when, when these processes occurred. And there's textbooks written about it, which is what I consulted when I was doing this research, I wanted to lay out what the what we'd expect to find if millions of years of heat and pressure had slowly changed these rocks compared to what we see in the rocks. And, and we'll come to that more of that in a moment. But the point is, if the sedimentary layers, the sediments of sand, mud and lime had been metamorphosed you know, over these millions of years with heat and pressure, there should have been new different minerals the original minerals that were in the rock when it was deposited as sand and mud and lime should have changed. And the cement, that is the bonding material, would have also changed. It would have potentially recrystallized, you know, and, and have a different character as with the grains. And so the corollary, the extra question that this research had to answer is, do we see evidence of this metamorphism of these rock layers because that's their rescuing device. We've got to not only show that the layers were bent while they were still soft and wet, we also have to show that there's no evidence of millions of years of heat and pressure metamorphosing the layers because as soon as we eliminate that evidence, we've lost, they've lost the 450, 500 million years. Wow, that's a lot to comprehend, isn't it? And well, let's dive into this. Now, I, I searched the literature, the scientific literature for 20 years. You know, I was going through the canyon on raft trips. We were taking people to look at these folds. We we're talking about the evidence. And I wondered to myself, has anyone sampled these folds? Has anyone gone to the trouble of trying to explain them? And so I thought, well, let's look at this, the literature. 
And you know what? I found that no one had ever checked these folds by collecting uh, samples and examining them carefully under microscopes. I thought, that's a bit strange. And then I looked in the literature, I thought for a minute, now, one of the basic things that geologists do in research, or they should do, is to take samples and look at the rocks under the microscope. And therefore, even, even in, the, um, in the scientific papers on these rock layers, they should be photographs of these rock layers as seen under the microscope. So you can see the grains and you can see the cement and everything. And lo and behold, what did I find? I had to go back to 1945 to find some black and white photographs of the Tapete sandstone taken under the microscope. So in other words, no one since has examined these rocks under the microscope. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back on saying that. I'm just saying that some of the basic geologic work hadn't been done in all that time. And so... Someone had to go in there and collect samples and do the work. And so I felt the need to do it. And so we launched into it. So let me sum up here. In a nutshell, what's this research all about? It's a long, long introduction, but it's very important to set the stage so that you can then understand how the research was done and the results from this research. The question we're answering here, was it, Deposition, that is depositing, laying down of these sediment layers. Then them hardening into rock, okay, sand becoming stone. After the hardening, the, they were bent, the layers were then bent in the folds, and all of that took over 500 million years. Is that how it was? Deposition, hardening, then bending. Or was it deposition, then bending? and hardening last. In other words, deposition, bending in the folds while the layers were still soft and wet, and then hardening all during the one year of the biblical, recent biblical global flood cataclysm. That's the question in an outshell. Let me repeat that, okay? So it's firmly fixed in your minds. This is the focus of this research project. Was it deposition, of layers over 500 million years, 450 million years, and hardening of those layers in that time, slowly and gradually. And then after all that had happened, was it bending? Or was it at the beginning of the flood, deposition of the layers recently, only thousands of years ago? And then at the end of the flood, only months later, while the layers were still soft and wet, they were bent. And only then were they hardened the floodwaters had gone and rocks were drying out so the cement could form. And so you can see the stark contrast. If the Bible is correct, which of course we believe it is, then it wipes out all those millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. And so that is a radical, radical departure from the conventional wisdom. And that's why this project is significant. So what was the next step? Well, the next step was to apply to get samples from the Grand Canyon. Now, let me let me point out here that we totally accept the need to have a proper process for uh, granting approval for collecting of samples in national parks. We're not advocating a free for all. Please don't get me wrong. If 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 it was open season. You know, people would go in with guns and shoot all the animals. People would go in with geological hammers and belt on all the rocks. It would be devastating. No, we want to keep our national parks pristine, in beautiful condition, so people can enjoy them. And so it's appropriate that there should be a proper process where scientists can put up research proposals and put in applications with those proposals to get approval to go and collect samples. And it's the, the Park Service has every right to process those applications, have them reviewed for their scientific robustness, and, and to check where the samples are going to be taken. Because after all, I could say I want a sample from a particular location, and I might not know it's actually a sensitive archaeological site. And there might be Native American pictographs there that they don't want ruined. 
and rightly so. And so they need to know where I want to collect the samples and they can say, well, sorry, you need to collect somewhere else because that's a sensitive archaeological site. And so we, we approve all that, okay? And I wanted to say that up front so you don't get me wrong about this. It's perfectly reasonable for the Park Service to have that, have that process. And so in late November 2013, yes, that's right, 2013, I submitted a process with an application to the Grand Canyon National Parks Research Office in Flagstaff, Arizona. And, and in the process of doing that, I had to submit not only the a robust research proposal with literature research and everything appended to it uh, with the application, but also three reviews of, from people I trusted to review that and say whether they thought it was a good proposal or not. And so all that was submitted to the Park Service. Well, in March 2014, that's four months later, give or take, the Park Service had sent out my application and proposal to their reviewers. And based on the reviews that they obtained, they sent me a note, a letter to say that the the proposed research was denied. For approval was not granted. However, we noticed that they gave no significant scientific um, reasons. Uh, you know, if, if, if my proposal was technically wrong or there were scientific glitches in what I was proposing, they had every right to tell me that and say, look, we're denying your application because you haven't done your homework well enough. Here are some scientific loopholes. You know, you've got to go away and do your homework before we're going to consider your application. And, you know, they're entitled to do that. But nothing like that was with the rejection letter. It was just a, a blanket rejection without any significant scientific errors being pointed out. Well, because of previous experiences that others had had, we smelt a rat, for one of a colloquial term. We thought, hmm, something doesn't seem right here. This seems like discrimination. Because after all, you know, you can go on Google and put my name in to Google and you'll find all these articles. Everybody around the world knows that I'm a young earth creationist. And so it's not hidden. It's not hidden. And therefore, if the Park Service was denying my application, maybe it was due to worldview discrimination. So we needed to find out. And as a consequence, lawyers from the Alliance Defending Freedom, who have, have worked with us creationists before, became involved. Um, one particular uh, lawyer, uh, he, he has had a, he, he defended another case with another creationist where the Grand Canyon National Park had, uh, had discriminated against him. And so it was only obvious that they should get involved. And what did they do? Well, the first step was to issue a freedom of information search, which they're entitled to do. There's a government legislation which allows uh, allows lawyers to request that information. And that meant that the Park Service, it was sent to the regional office of the uh, West uh, the Grand, uh, the National Park Service. So it was above the, the Grand Canyon National Park to the next level up, uh, demanding or requesting all the correspondence related to my research application. In other words, correspondence between the research office officials with external reviewers and everything like that. Well, we got all this information that came back. And what did we see? We saw the reviews from these external reviewers. And not surprisingly, the Park Service, the research office, the Grand Canyon National Park Research Office, had sent my application and proposal to various professors at secular universities, people who had done research in the Grand Canyon. Fair enough. They're, they're well qualified in that regard. But they all have a worldview that says only millions of years of slow and geological processes supposedly can explain what happened in the canyon. And they knew that I was a young earth creationist. And so they just said, and it was there in black and white, 
He's a young earth creationist. He shouldn't be allowed to do the research. Reject it. Now, one of the professors had a few trivial scientific comments, but all the others just dismissed the research application on the basis of my worldview. And so it was a slam dunk case of worldview discrimination. Was it because the proposal wasn't well well written? Was it because the proposal had any scientific glitches? It was simply because it was promoting the view that the world is young and that the world was destroyed at the time of the flood. And so they could see the problems that I highlighted earlier to you, okay? They know that these folds are bent smoothly without shattering. They know that it, it could well be that it was when the rocks were still soft and wet. And, and they know that that therefore rules out their hundreds of millions of years. So, of course, they had to oppose me getting this research grant. So what did we do? Well, after going through all this and figuring it all out, we decided that, hey, let's push the boundaries here. Let's, let's put the pressure back on the Grand Canyon National Park Research Office. So what did I do? I tightened up the proposal, dealt with the, with the um, trivial scientific issues that had been pointed out, you know, added a few more references, justified things very carefully, you know, made sure everything was uh, better explained and harder for them to refute. And then I, so I resubmitted another application and the, a, a modified research proposal in February 2016. Yeah, it took time because I had lots of other things to do in the meantime. Life doesn't stand still in this busy answers in Genesis office, I assure you. Well, what happened? Soon thereafter, what did the Grand Canyon National Park Research Office do? It insisted that before they would consider the proposal, I first of all had to submit to them in my proposal the exact sample lo location details, that is GPS coordinates for every sample site that I wanted to collect from and photos of that site. In other words, I, they were requesting that I do a, a trip through the canyon, which I regularly do. They knew that. They knew that I do regular trips with, with families, uh, teaching them about the Grand Canyon and having fun going over the rapids. We do that every year. Lots of, lots of uh, trips that we, can, we, we partner with Canyon Ministries, <clears throat> our, our partners. And uh, so they, they said, you need to do a trip through the canyon, take photographs of the sites, get the sample coordinates and send all that information. And then, then we'll examine your, your proposal. Now, there was no applicant, there was no, there was no indication that if you do that, we're going to grant it to you. No, no. They kept their options open. So there was no guarantee that if I went to all that trouble, they were going to approve the, the research proposal and the res and give me the permit to collect the samples. So what did the Alliance Defending Lawyers do? They thought, well, okay, let's do another freedom of information search. Let's find out about all the research applications for the past 12 months through 2015 and into 2016. Let's see what stipulations they put on other applications and proposals. Okay. Now, if they'd asked others, to provide the GPS sample coordinates and photographs of where that, well, you know, okay, we're equally tr treated equally. Okay, so we needed to find out whether they were treating me as equally as other scientists. So what did we do? We got back all the information on all these, pr these applications through the past 12 months or more. And what did we find? Well, we found all the geological proposals. There wasn't a hint of that kind of request. No one else had been asked to provide the GPS coordinates of the sample locations. No one else had been asked to provide photographs. In fact, here's the irony. 
one of those applications was from one of those three reviewers that had rejected my app first application on the basis that I was a young earth creationist. Okay. And how did they treat his application? Yeah, they gave it to him straight away. I was asking for samples the size of a closed fist. He was asking for samples the size of footballs. And he was asking for permission to have a helicopter fly in and take his samples out for him. And they granted to him freely. Do what you like. And yet they were discriminating against me that I had to go in and get the photographs and the sample locations. So in other words, I was being discriminated against. They were stonewalling me. Okay, so we found no other research applicants had been requested to do these things. So what did the Alliance Defending Lawyers decide to do? Well, in late 2016, they sent a letter to the superintendent of the Grand Canyon National Park with all these details about the discrimination being displayed by the, the research office of the park, which was under the purview uh, in the chain of command, the superintendent has jurisdiction over the research office. So she needed to get her troops to do the right thing instead of discriminating. That's what we we're saying in the letter. We're demanding equal treatment before the law, before the law, no discrimination that she should, she should reverse this discrimination demanding that I first of all get the sample locations uh, photographed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because, you know, quite frankly, if I'd done that, they could still have, have refused the application. Well, what happened? There was silence. Months went by, months went by, and no response from the Park Service at all. So, we decided, myself with the Alliance Defending Freedom Lawyers, that it was time to take off the kid gloves and put on the boxing gloves and really do something that would shake up the system. And what did that mean? Filing a lawsuit, okay, filing a lawsuit, okay? And let's, let's back up here a minute. What happened you know, in 2016? A new president was elected. Okay, and in early May 2017, that new president issued an executive order that uh, bureaucracy in Washington should not discriminate based on race, color, you know, color skin, worldview. Okay, and that was early May. You know, the Lord's timing is always perfect. The beginning of May, the president issues that executive order. The Park Service had not responded to our um, our protest, uh, official protest with this letter to the superintendent. And so the, the lawsuit was prepared. And just before we filed the lawsuit, we got a, a, a letter from the superintendent of the park responding to that letter, and it was more stonewalling. It wasn't a satisfactory letter of response. So what did we do? On May 9, 2017, we filed a lawsuit on my behalf in the U.S. Federal Court in Phoenix for the District of Columbia uh, that uh, was against the Park Service and the Department of the Interior. Okay, so the the um, the defendants were the uh, superintendent of the Grand Canyon National Park, who was named, the regional director of the National Park Service, the director of the National Park Service and the secretary to the U.S. Department of the Interior. In other words, the whole chain of command was being taken to court for worldview discrimination against me because under the U.S. Constitution and also the president's executive order, the, U the, the government should not discriminate against its citizens and, and you know, uh, based on worldview. Now, of course, I'm not a citizen, but I'm a green card holder. And so I have the same rights as a U.S. citizen because I come under the umbrella of the U.S. Constitution. And so, um, and so uh, we were suing the federal government. And so this was a serious matter. And it was also a very public matter. And so 
we issued a media release and therefore news of this legal action soon appeared, believe it or not, on the front pages of the Washington Times and of the New York Times. Okay, so, you know, hey, presto, we're now suddenly in the public eye. Um, they can see, they, they can, the reporters can dig into this for themselves and see for themselves because, you know, the lawsuit is on the public record and the lawsuit had appended to it all the pages and pages and pages of the letters and reviews outlining this discrimination. So anybody could have got this information for themselves. Anybody could see that this was a clear case of world discrimination because there it was in black and white. He shouldn't be given this permit to go into the Grand Canyon and collect samples because he's a young earth creationist. So what happened? Well, the lawyers, I mean, we were, we were suing the federal government, so the Department of Justice had to get involved. And so lawyers from the Department of Justice and the Department of the Interior had to respond to the lawsuit. And they were not blind. They could see that it was a clear case of world discrimination. And so they said, we've got to get together with these Alliance for Defending Freedom lawyers very quickly because this is an open and shut case. We've got to settle this very quickly because, you know, it, it, we can't have our bosses dragged into court. I mean, the, the department, the, the secretary for the Department of the Interior, that's a cabinet post under the president of the US, dragged into court and lampooned about this worldview discrimination. No, no, we've got to settle this quickly. So what happened? Well, within a month, by June 7, Okay, the lawsuit was filed on May 9, 2017. By June 7, 2017, the research, they said, okay, let's get this settled. Resubmit your research proposal and application. So that's what I did on June 7. By June 13, they'd approved the research and sampling permit. And we'd also ask, because, you know, the lawyers say, what did you want? You know, these... Justice Department lawyers were thinking we're going to ask for a million dollars. No, no, we weren't asking for money. We just wanted the sampling permit. And while you're at it, we want a permit to do the river trip because, after all, every river trip, every raft trip, you have to have a permit to do it. And to do a research trip has a, is a special special use res uh, permit uh, through the canyon. And so we said we need one of those as well. And sure enough, it was issued on June 21, and then it was signed and, and finalised by June 23. And so that meant when we had everything in granted to us, it was only natural that on June 28, 2017, you know, barely seven weeks after the lawsuit was filed, victory was granted, and so we went ahead and voluntarily dismissed the lawsuit. Now, of course... There was a press release announcing this lawsuit victory and on June 28, and it resulted in a media flurry, a media flurry. And articles appeared in newspapers across the, the, the USA. And, you know, interestingly, soon after this victory, lawsuit victory, I went into the Grand Canyon on a, research, on a regular trip. And when you're in the canyon, you have no access to your phone, internet, or, or, or the internet. And so I didn't know what was going up there up in the rim world while I was down there in the canyon. I came out of the canyon and there was everything was going crazy. In fact, I discovered that a report on this lawsuit victory had even appeared on the front page of Australia's only national newspaper, The Australian. And here it is, complete with a photograph of me. Oz creationist, Oz is short for Australian. Oz Creationist wins Canyon Row. And there's a photograph of me in the canyon. And I was on the front page with the president. How about that for media exposure? And so everybody around the globe knew about this creationist, geologist, who had sued the park, the Grand Canyon National Park, and won. Shudder, shudder, shudder. A biblical creationist having a victory of, uh, against worldview discrimination. And... Uh, this lawsuit victory even showed up in the science media. Uh, the US's premier weekly journal, Science, 
everybody's heard of the American Association for the Advancement of, of Science, AAAS. Its journal is a its flagship journal is science. It appears every week. It's one of the two leading global science journals. Okay, there was a report on the lawsuit in that journal, and there was also a report in the newsletter of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. So it got a lot of coverage. And of course, in both of those instances, in the professional literature, there were scathing comments about my academic credentials. I mean, that's typical. You know, they don't just attack the scientists, uh, the science that we're doing, they attack the scientists. You know, they'll say that, a, a, a true scientist can't be a creationist. That's nonsense. We do science, and that's one of the one of the things about this uh, project is that we're showing people that scientists who are creationists actually do real science. Science. We go out and collect the samples. We go out and do the laboratory work. We go and write up the work and and publish it like everyone else does. And so, uh, leading ac academics. Uh, lampooned me, uh, and and you know they 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 continued to uh, rubbish me and and oppose this research and oppose the lawsuit. So we're getting to the to the nitty gritty now. Finally, finally, okay, it's the process started in November 2013. Now, finally, on August 6, we launched into the Grand Canyon. August 6, 2017, we finally launched on a raft trip it was an eight day raft trip the 6th to the 12th of of august um we had to we had to go the full length of the grand canyon on this research trip we you launch at the boat boat ramp at lee's ferry you have to do the whole 277 miles through the canyon down to the boat ramp at, at pierce's ferry to take the the rafts out these were two small 22 foot motorized rafts and on, off we went to collect 53 fist-sized samples from these three rock layers and these four folds. The trip was outfitted and led. I mean, it's very important that we have qualified people to do this. I'm not a boatman, and uh, we, we need people who know how to run the rapids in the canyon because novices uh, can. Accidents happen when you have novices. And so the trip was outfitted and led by Tom Vale. Tom Vale used to be a Grand Canyon River guide, decades of experience in the canyon. Uh, and he became a Christian and, found, and he became the founder of Canyon Ministries, our partner ministry, for the trips through the canyon. So he organized his friend Terry Vallely, who, who had a boat as well, uh, these 22-foot rafts, two tubes, inflatable tubes, with a metal frame between them. And so there was Tom Vale, there was Terry Vallely, there was myself as a principal investigator. You know, why do we take two rafts? Well, you've got a backup. If something happens to one raft, you've got the second raft. So you always take a backup. And so I decided that I needed a backup geologist. And so I asked my good friend and colleague, Dr. John Whitmore, who's Senior Professor of Geology at Cedar, Cedarville University, uh, to come with me. And it's just as well I did, by the way, because uh, I, there was an accident. I had a fall in the Grand Canyon and got injured. And so John, it was just as well I had a backup geologist to help with the sampling. Um, and we had two support crew, plus we had a videographer. Why a videographer? Well, the Alliance Defend and Freedom, in their wisdom, knew that if we did anything wrong, the Park Service would accuse us. And so they said, look, you've got to take a videographer with you so that he can video everything that you do in the canyon so that if anyone makes an accusation of malpractice, we've got the video evidence that you didn't do that. And so that's why we've got footage of this raft trip through this research through the canyon. Okay. We'll take a break in a minute and I'll wrap this up for uh, this, this presentation, part one. What was our research uh, approach? Well, in this research trip through the canyon, this was the approach. 
we wanted to sample the three rock layers bent in these faults, uh, in these four faults, okay? So we wanted to collect uh, samples systematically in those faults. And I'll show you in, in our next uh, segment, uh, next session, uh, the details of that. But here's the point. Uh, you know, we wanted to take the samples in the limbs of the fold, that is, to the edge of where the layers are still flat, through the bend, we call that the hinge, okay? Now, the, if, if, if the processes of heat and pressure had affected the, the, in the bends, there should be difference between the, in the layers, in the rocks, in the minerals and textures, between the samples in the bends and the samples in the limbs, okay? So we had to systematically collect through the flat layers, the bent layers, and out again, okay, in the folds. But you, you know what they do in medical trials? You know, they give people, one group of people, the medicine, and another group of people, tablets that don't have the medicine in them. We call it a placebo, don't we? Okay, so you can compare whether you know, how the effects on people of that medicine compared to the people who aren't taking the medicine. But nobody knows except the researchers who's taking the real medicine and who's not. Well, we also therefore had to collect samples from these three rock layers from miles away, miles away from these folds. Okay, and, and why would we do that? Well, if the rocks were all still soft and wet when they were bent, they would be soft and wet in the folds and they would be soft and wet miles away. And therefore, you wouldn't expect to find any difference in the rock layers from miles away, from in the limb of the fold, or in the bend of the folds. Okay? But if heat and pressure had been applied to the rock to bend them, okay, after the cementing had taken place, the cement and the grains in the bend should have affected the rock differently to the rock in the flat lying layers near the fold and in the rock layers miles away. There should be distinct differences. And so this was a clear cut either or situation. It was very important to collect those samples away from the fold. So that was our strategy. And that was our strategy as we launched into this project. So let me wrap up at this point. We've, we've talked about the layers in the canyon. We've talked about them, you know, over millions of years versus the flood. We've set up this problem, this contrast. You know, the layers were formed rapidly during the flood. They'd still be soft and wet when they were bent at the end of the flood versus the layers were deposited over slowly and gradually over millions of years. They dried out and hardened and then bent, okay, hundreds of millions of years later. Was it deposition? bending during the flood, at the end of the flood, and then hardening, the biblical view? Or was it deposition over millions of years, hardening over min hundreds of millions of years, and then bending hundreds of millions years of years later? That's the question we wanted to answer, and that's why we collected the samples. It was well worth the effort, as you'll see when we come back in our next presentation well worth the effort of fighting to get these samples, fighting against worldview discrimination. We had to show through this project that creation scientists do real science, do real research, and can, can justify their research and present their research and show that it's just as valid, if not more valid, when we take a biblical worldview, we can confirm that the evidence in God's world confirms God's word. So thank you for listening. I'm Dr. Andrew Snelling. See you next time.